Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from the University of Texas Health at San Antonio, and today we're going to talk about the basics of bone imaging. We're going to try to develop a basic approach to bone imaging, including the radiograph, CT scan, and MRI. We're going to try to differentiate if the pathology is originating within the bone or within the articulation and then affecting the bone. We're going to discuss in general terms the eternal battle between the osteoclast and osteoblast and how that pertains to imaging. And briefly, we're going to try to differentiate an osteos or articular acute chronic or indolent process. I'm going to show this radiograph at the beginning and at the end of the conference. And the general idea is that when you are presented with a study such as this elbow, which has AP and lateral views. Usually, if I show it to a first year resident, they will concentrate on this large lesion or erosion at the proximal ulna, and they usually start describing about tumors within the bone. However, there is a big effusion and there is destruction of bones elsewhere, and this happens to be an articular process, which, we, which we're going to describe as we move along. In terms of a process, originating from the articulation or the end of the bone, there is some things we need to look at in the radiograph, CT or MRI. So every time we see a lesion that is close to the end of the bone, we should always try to figure out if the lesion is originating from the bone or is from the articulation that is extending to the bone. So articular processes will have joint distension either with an effusion or hemarthrosis or pause or synovitis. The synovitis can be active or inactive. Active synovitis is usually vascular and will have contrast enhancement on MRI and CT scan. Also, the pathology will be on both sides of the articulation. Keep in mind that when I mean both sides of the articulation, it means that it is affecting the subchondral plate and causing destruction of the bone that is immediately adjacent to the articulation. And sometimes this may not be definite on radiographs, especially on the early disease. When a process is originating from the end of the bone, we will see a lesion at the end of the bone, but there will be normal bone between the lesion and the subchondral plate. So let's look at some examples. We have a pelvis AP view with multiple rounded sclerotic lesions throughout the pelvic bones center around the articulation. These lesions appear to be on both sides of the articulation. However, the articulation appears normal in this radiograph. There is no joint collapse, bone destruction around the articulation, or evidence of radiographic effusion. These are multiple bone islands, also known as osteopoikilosis. And although the multiple lesions are on both sides of the articulation, the articulation is normal. So this is a bone process. Another example, we have bilateral elbow radiographs. And here we see that on both elbows, the right and the left, there is chronic destruction of the bone around the elbow articulation, including the distal humerus, the proximal ulna, and proximal radius. There is also subluxation. This is an articular process because it is centered within the articulation and it affects both sides of the bone, including the subchondral plate, as we see erosions and destruction of the ends of the bone. In this case, it is a chronic process and it's systemic because it's bilateral and chronic because we have well-defined erosions. On this patient, we obtain an MRI and we have T1 and T2 weighted images. The T2 weighted images are with fat suppression. And we see that within the articulation, there are regions of decreased T1 and decreased T2 signal intensity with susceptibility artifact. This is related to hemosiderin deposition due to recurrent hemarthrosis. We can also see the bone destruction and erosions. This is a big erosion here on the T1 and on the T2. So we have here another case. We have AP views of the chest and AP view of the left knee. And in this patient, we see multiple lesions in almost all the visualized bones at the distal femoral metaphysis, proximal tibial metaphysis, as well as the proximal fibular diaphysis and bilateral proximal humeri. These lesions appear to have continuation with the medullary cavity and some of them point away from the articulation. This is a classic example of an osteochondroma 
There happens to be multiple throughout the body and a condition called multiple hereditary osteochondromatosis or exostosis. The point here is that we have lesions on both sides of the articulation. However, they are far away from the subchondral bone and the articulation itself looks normal. So even though like the osteopoikilosis, these are lesions in multiple parts of the body, it is a bone process and not an articular process given that the articulation is normal. So let's try again. So we have an AP radiograph in internal and external rotation of the shoulder. And we see that there is some destruction and flattening of the humeral head. At first sight, we may think, well, this is a vascular necrosis of the humeral head with collapse. However, we see that there is distension of the axillary recess, which is part of the glenohumeral joint. And this distension is with high density. So there is some type of calcification or calcific density within a distended glenohumeral joint. It is hard to evaluate the glenoid to see if there's any destruction, but there is some sclerosis and irregularity. So we can assume that the glenoid is also involved. So in this case, we have everything that we need to, this, to make the assumption that this is an articular process. We have this tension of the articulation, in this case with calcific density. We have destruction of the subchondral plate on the humeral side, and we have destruction of the subchondral plate on the glenoid side. This is hydroxyapatite deposition within the joint with a destructive arthropathy, also known as Milwaukee's shoulder. And this is an articular process. The great radiologist pays attention to secondary findings. This is the same for any other radiology subspeciality. So the important things in MSK radiology are age. If the patient is pediatric or adult, we can find that pretty easily in MSK due to the growth plate. If there is an open growth plate, we assume it's a pediatric patient. The distribution, the mono versus poly, if a lesion is monostatic or polyostatic, one lesion or multiple lesions of the same throughout the body. If the lesion is monoarticular or polyarticular, meaning that it only affects one articulation or affects multiple articulation. Some of the problems that we see in MSK are axial, and some are appendicular, and the differential diagnosis varies between these two locations. And within the bone of the diaphysis, metaphysis, or epiphysis, where it's located within the bone itself is important in the differential diagnosis. Also, it's good to never forget the soft tissues. We may be able to find soft tissue swelling, soft tissue gas, or soft tissue calcifications and increased density that will help us in our differential diagnosis. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the battle for supremacy of the bone. It is a battle between the osteoclast and the osteoblast. I have this funny uh, picture that I got in from the internet, from Facebook. Uh, I try to find who is the author of this, but I couldn't find it, it's everywhere out there. But it brings a good point and it helps us in terms of imaging and trying to narrow our differential diagnosis. As you remember from medical school, the osteoblasts are the cells that produce bone. And in terms of imaging, they will deposit calcium. So you will see as bone production, trabecular bone, and increased density in the radiograph. The osteoclasts on the other side are the cells that will eat the bone. They will call bone resorption and destruction. So in the radiograph, this will look as a lucency, as bone destruction. As you remember from medical school, in normal bone, there is an there is a good balance between osteoblastic activity and osteoclastic activity. However, in disease of the bone uh, that we see loosened lesions, usually there is an overtaking of the osteoclast, like we see in this uh, picture here. Here, the osteoclast becomes bad, and instead of using a, uh, a hammer, he's using dynamite, and the osteoblast remain using the normal brick that it was using on the normal bone. And this will cause obviously a lytic lesion or an erosion, bone resorption and destruction. In general terms, this is usually a seen in aggressive tumors and infection and an inflammatory arthropathy. This is so because osteoclastic activity is activated by increased vascularity among other things. But to simplify things of what we see in the radiographs, Every time we have any condition that would increase vascularity, that will increase the osteoclastic activity. The more vascular the lesion, the more osteoclastic activity that we see and the more aggressive that it will be.
So now that we know the importance of osteoblast and osteoclast activity and how they show up on radiographs, let's see some examples. Here we have four different cases. On the left side, we have the less aggressive lesions, and on the right side, we have the most aggressive lesions. So we're going to try to describe these images in terms of their borders and how that um, explains their behavior in terms of physiology and pathophysiology. So on the left side, we have a non-ossifying fibroma, which is a benign non-aggressive lesion. It's a don't touch loosened lesion of the bone. So we have a peripheral medullary cavity lesion, which is well-defined and has thin sclerotic borders. In this lesion, you know very well where is the beginning of the lesion and where is the end. And if you have a pencil, you can trace a line around the lesion. So this is very non-aggressive, so a lytic lesion where the body has completely stopped the advancement of osteoclastic activity and there is no uh, no significant recruitment of osteoblast. That thin sclerotic line was developed by the osteoblast producing bone, but it's pretty much non-active because it's very thin. This is called a narrow son of transition. If we move to the second image, we have a coronal reconstruction images of the tibia, and we see a well-defined lesion. In this particular lesion, we can trace a pencil and know where is the beginning of the lesion and where is the end. However, the border, although sclerotic, like the non ossifying fibroma, the sclerotic border is very thick. And as you move away from the lesion, that sclerotic border becomes less sclerotic. So this is an intermediate in terms of aggressiveness. What does this mean? It means that the lesion is active, but not aggressive. That is so because the osteoclasts are still eating of the bone, but the osteoblasts have had time to mount a response. However, there is still recruiting of osteoblasts. That is why there's such a thick borders. As you move away from the lesion, more osteoblasts are trying to produce bone to contain the lesion. So, so this is saying to us, okay, this thick chlorotic border means that the lesion is active, but it's not super aggressive. There is still some time for the body to react to it. On the third images, we have a patient with a giant cell tumor of the bone. And we have a very well-defined loosened lesion at the end of the bone. But what do we what we can say of this border? This border is well defined. We know where it begins and we, we know where it ends. However, it is non-sclerotic. So now that you have a border that is non-sclerotic, what this means is the osteoclastic activity is going forward through the bone, and the osteoblasts are not don't have any way to stop in that. So the absence of a sclerotic border means that there is not enough time for the osteoblast to try to stop the lesion. So even though it's intermediate in aggressiveness, it is more aggressive than the lesions with sclerotic borders. And the last image, we see a lesion here in the proximal tibial uh, diaphysis. And this is a patient with a tumor, aggressive tumor. And what we see is that you cannot trace a line around this lesion. You don't know where it begins and you don't know where it ends. This is called a, a white zone of transition, and it uh, tells us that this lesion is very aggressive. It's aggressive because it's vascular and the osteoclastic activity is moving forward across the bone unchecked. The osteoblasts haven't been able to stop this lesion at all. They haven't been able to define a border of the lesion to stop it, and obviously they haven't been able to produce bone to stop the lesion. So. This is the most aggressive, ill-defined, and nosclerotic borders. So let's review again real quick. Well-defined with thin sclerotic borders, probably a non-active lesion, non-aggressive. Well-defined lesion with thick sclerotic borders, which means it's an intermediate lesion, likely active, but not super aggressive. Then we have a well-defined lesion, but with non-sclerotic border, which is also intermediate, but a little bit more aggressive given that the osteoblasts have no time to produce bone to create a barrier between the lesion and the normal bone and the more aggressive white zone of transition no borders no sclerosis nor nothing just because the lesion is vascular and aggressive and it's eating up the bone too fast for the osteoblast to even respond in any way Okay, so what would you say about this radiograph? We have AP and lateral views of the leg, 
and we see that there is an ill-defined lesion within the anterior cortex of the tibial diaphysis. Can you trace a pencil around this lesion? No, you can't because the sonar transition is wide. It has a primitive pattern. So this would say it is an aggressive vascular lesion because it doesn't have any sclerotic border and it has no well-defined borders. On MRI of this patient, we see that there is an inter intracortical lesion that shows peripheral enhancement and extends into the soft tissues. This ended up being an intraosseous osteomyelitis, which is a non-malignant but aggressive lesion due to the increased vascularity. So in this case, we see how the increased vascularity creates that white zone of transition that increase osteoclastic activity and no time for the osteoblast to respond to it so there is no bone production within the bone at all. Always remember that problems or tumors or inflammation of the soft tissues can sometimes attack or affect the adjacent bone. This is a subtle case. We have small cortical erosions at the distal ulnar styloid process and this is very common in early rheumatoid arthritis and the reason is because the extensor carpal nariis tendon just runs next to the ulnar styloid process and when you get inflammatory tendinovitis of the tendon of the ECU the vascularity of the tendon sheet within the tendon sheet will extend or will affect the adjacent bone activating that osteoclastic activity and creating small cortical erosions in this case, it was a golfer, a patient that played too much golf, was uh, told by the physician to stop, but he didn't. He developed an intrasubstance partial tear of the extensor carpi ulnaris, and all this soft tissue abnormality is inflammatory. Tenosynovitis related to mechanical repetition, and that synovitis uh, within the tendon sheath it caused that small erosion on the bone. So, it is a process of the soft tissues that because of the increased vascularity affected the adjacent bone. So in this case, it was not an articular or bone problem, but a soft tissue problem that extended into the adjacent bone. But this is the least common. So let's go back and put it all together. So we have AP and lateral radiographs of the elbow joint. And as we saw at the beginning of the conference, there is a large erosion or lesion within the proximal ulna. However, there is also a large effusion here, big effusion with the anterior sail sign displacement of the anterior fat pad of the elbow. And we can also see destruction at the radial head peripherally. And we also see some destruction of the distal humerus at the level of the capitellum and at the level of the trochlea. So putting it all, all together, we have joint distension with an effusion or synovitis, and we have destruction of the subchondral bone at the distal humerus, proximal ulna, and proximal radius. We know this is an articular process. What else we can say about this image? We know that the erosion or the lesion uh, has in some regions well-defined sclerotic borders. You can trace a pencil around this erosion and it's very thin, so it looks like a non-aggressive lesion. However, this erosion in the posterior aspect of the olecranon is well-defined, but has no sclerotic border. So taking all into consideration, this will be an arthropathy that is between acute and chronic, so we call that indolent. In this patient, we did an MRI. We have T1, T2, and T1 fat sat images, and we see that there is a large joint effusion with extensive synovitis that is causing chronic destruction of the bone and rim enhancement. This is a chronic indolent arthropathy. In this case was tuberculous arthritis. Thank you for listening to this conference. You can follow me on Instagram at MSK Radiology Genie or at Facebook MSK Radiology Genie. Thank you.